Hello everyone and good afternoon and welcome to New Art Exchange. My name is Suzy Zopiri and I'm the Associate Artistic Director here. I'm one of the co-curators of DELU and Amber Wanyo's new exhibition um, which has just opened with us. Um, today's in conversation will be um, between Enam Bawanyo and Lisa Anderson, um, who will speak about her work and her journey as an artist. And before we get into the conversation, um, just for people who are viewing online, um, this is also a hybrid event, so there are in-person attendees, and of course for those who are um, here in person, um, there will be people attending online as well. The conversation will be around an hour, um, and there will be an opportunity for questions and answers um, following the conversation. For those in the room, there will be a roaming mic where you'll be able to ask questions. And um, for those who are viewing on YouTube, um, you'll be able to place your questions in the chat and we'll read them out um, to be answered later on. Um, so before we get into the, um, the discussion, um, I'll just quickly introduce today's speakers. So um, our first speaker is Enam Bawanyo, um, who is our exhibiting artist. Um, she's a British Ghanaian textile and performance artist, curator and founder founder of BBFA, which is the Black British Female Artist Collective. Her art practice investigates identity, womanhood in particular, whilst advocating the healing benefits of craft. She uses performance as a vessel, creating live experiences of healing and direction to a positive place of awareness to counter systems of oppression, such as racism and sexism. Her work enables audiences to face the truth of a dark past surrounding colonial legacies and the emotions they bring forth. Recent exhibitions include Body Poetics at Southampton's Giant Gallery and Rites of Passage at Gagosian in London. Her work has been presented internationally at the 58th Venice Biennale, Art X in Lagos, Nigeria and Untitled Art Fair in Miami. In 2022, she was one of 16 artists selected for the prestigious Black Rock Residency in Dakar, Senegal, founded by acclaimed artist Kehinde Wiley. She is represented by London-based gallery Taffeta, who specialise in 20th century contemporary African art. Our second speaker today is Lisa Anderson, who is an avid contemporary arts enthusiast and advisor with ex expert knowledge on art from the African diaspora in the UK and beyond. She is currently managing director of Black Cultural Archives, um, an archive and heritage centre in Brixton that is devoted to the histories of people of African and Caribbean descent in Britain. She is also the founder of Black British Art, which is an online curatorial black, um, platform to showcase the variety and depth of this phenomenal corner of the art market. In 2016, she was selected as one of 10 curators to complement the International Curators Forum, uh, cu sorry, the International Curators Forum's Diaspora Pavilion project for the 2017 Venice Biennale. She has since curated private exhibitions for Latham and Watkins, featuring artists who have gone on to be selected as Bloomberg New Contemporary Artists and featured in major international art collections. She has represented artists at Basel as a trustee for Addis Fine Art, International, visited international biennales during the Grand Tour, presented papers at a number of academic conferences and written articles for a variety of arts platforms. So I will hand over to our two speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ooh. <laughs> so I'm going to open up this conversation by saying how much of an honour it is to have been asked by my dear friend Anam to facilitate this conversation and reflection on her artistic journey to this point. It was quite moving hearing both of our biographies being read out because actually they're so interlinked, particularly over the last 10 years. Um, so much of the work that Enam has produced has empowered and informed my path as a curator, as an arts enthusiast, and I'd like to think vice versa as well. Absolutely. So I first came to know, well, just before we had this, we started this uh, conversation here today, obviously we were talking in preparation for this conversation. I had it in my mind that I had approached Anam. <laughs> <laughs> but she reminded me that she had actually approached me. Stalked you. Stalked me, <laughs> apparently, via Twitter. So uh, back in the mid 2010s, mm -hmm when actually we were just starting to get to grips with the power of uh, online social media for engaging audiences with 
a wider conversation in art. Um, I was just starting up a platform called Black British Art, and Enam had, for not too long, mm -hmm. started to really create this platform to support other black women in their artistic practice, the collective. Mm -hmm. And um, at this time also, I think Enam was just starting to get into her groove as an artist centering her practice more in her life. Um, as a graduate in textile design mm -hmm. from Europe, from Bradford School of Art mm -hmm. and Design, um, she'd gone on to become a, a knitwear designer in the States and doing very well in that. But then, you know, due to market forces, uh, that coming to an end, a decision was made to come back to United Kingdom and really put art practice, her own voice, at the centre of her life. That's when I really came to know and am. And it's just wonderful to see that all these years on, this is a landmark moment where we can really celebrate the journey. I'm just going to start with just highlighting a few areas that we connected on and asking you to reflect on that. <laughs> so you're somebody, for me, who is so much of a doer, and that, obviously, many art, you would say that is, uh, would be a common denominator for most artists, but there's such a multimodal approach to your doing. Not only are you a doer in terms of the craft of the work that you create, but in the framing of the work, you're a brilliant writer, your work doesn't only ex express itself through textile, but also sculpturally, through performance, physical performance, and then also informing the direction of film. I mean, what is there that you can't, <laughs> you can't do? Oh, I want to highlight these three things. That when we talked and we were connecting beyond the obvious connection with visual art, we shared a love of art, dance yes. and performance. Um, both of us as first generation black British women were intrinsically connected to the conversation about our connection back to the continent. So having an Afropolitan kind of perspective and, and focus on you know, how, to, how can we empower that wider conversation of the black experience, African diasporic experience. And third, we were very much into multidisciplinary mm -hmm. practice. And I think all of that apart from you being a Virgo, <laughs> is really beautifully reflected in the fact that you've chosen to bring it all together through this kind of grounding practice of textile. Mm. Because that's the golden thread, yeah. pun in intended, mm -hmm. that runs through it all. And textile, we can think of it as a language, it's a concept, and it's a material. That is a multimodal... Um, form of practice that allows for so many different possibilities and for me really allows you to speak to three themes that I think are really core to your work that we're going to explore through this. Um, embodied knowledge, mm. how that's embodied through the actual materiality of the, mm. the, the fabric, the textiles that you use, the artisanal craft mm. that's in that's required to create the work, and then the materiality mm -hmm. of the textiles. So that brings us to, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this exhibition and the fact that it takes us through how you got into textiles. But when I first met you and I came to your studio, the first works that I saw were actually beautiful, colourful, like, figurative floral works yeah. that looked like Georgia O'Keeffe. Yeah. And in the corner, you had these little works that had some little threads in it. Yeah. So you've made quite a huge leap. Let's start from there, Absolutely. like talking about how you, when you started your artistic practice, were thinking, mm. you know, let me just start painting. Mm. <laughs> and then slowly but surely, the roots started to come mm. through you of your textile practice from your study into your work. Mm. Yeah, I mean, with the painting, it's something that 
I just, I really kind of gravitated to initially because, and I think it's still core to my practice now, is this thing of returning back to nature and how, because we've been so consumed by technology, we've really lost that connection mm. to the natural world and that kind of universal alignment. Um, and so initially when I started um, making artwork, it was kind of directly looking at flora and fauna and going deep into a cellular level because they were always quite kind of detailed abstract paintings going kind of deeper into the leaves of the plants and things. Um, and I was really enjoying that work. Um, and then it, when I started the Nude Me body of work in 2016, it's really because I had this spark of an idea. Mm. Because I started seeing lots of tight brands, uh, black owned tight brands, creating new tights for women of color. And that sparked that seed of thought of, oh, well, how long has it taken us to get to this point? And I really wanted to investigate that. And obviously being, a textile artist and kind of being so um, enamoured with materiality, I was also thinking about the idea of creating artwork with tights and that really excited me. So when I first started this body of work, it started from a point of research. I basically took it back to university and how we were kind of immersed into creating work was always starting from a point of research. So I went to the V&A and started going through their archives and I actually started by looking at print advertising and I wanted to see if and where blackness um, was apparent within the advertising. So kind of started from the Mad Men kind of heyday um, and I actually came across some really, um, really kind of violent um, adverts that were attacking blackness which wasn't necessary. This is tights, you're advertising hosiery. Um, and then obviously I was also looking at how women were sexualized and thinking of the fact that for black women we're either overtly sexualized or our femininity is completely taken away from us. Mm -hmm. And so those were the kind of points of entry. And so when I actually first started the work, I started with um, creating etched prints because doing textile design, we did printmaking, we did knit, um, we did knit, we did weave, we did embroidery, and I enjoy all of those um, kind of areas of fabric making and, and manipulation. Um, and so, and I just really wanted to get back into the print room and kind of test things out. Um, and then started exploring actually working with the tights. Um, and the journey has just been, it's been really interesting because starting with that research and then that leading me into other kind of themes um, has just really opened up the scope of the work and even the performance part came from starting to then look at the ballet industry and looking at how black and brown ballet dancers were um, othered in you know this this form of art that they're truly passionate about but they still can't fully be embraced in it mm -hmm. um, and that led into how I started then creating my movement through performance um, and so it's always kind of been interlinked the research has informed the practice has informed how I've made the work, the mediums that I use to make the work. Um, and it's an ongoing series, so it's continue, I'm continuing to explore how I manipulate the tights. How I started that body of work mm -hmm. even has changed. You know, the way mm. that I, I make the artworks now is so different from the first, you know, um, artworks that I was making where I was burning through the tights and, and embroidering on them. And now I'm actually using them to knit and actually make these sculptural kind of soft sculpture pieces. So, yeah. <laughs> So much to, to dig into, but I just want to go back to how you first started thinking about textiles more intentionally. And obviously mm. you had that spark of idea mm. in, in response to those brands. From this position now, can you see how your role as a facilitator for black, art, black female artists and your connection to home, how that informed that spark? how that ignited that spark. What I'm really pointing to is the, the kind of politics that underlines yeah. your interest in that. Yeah. I just think it's potentially really inspiring for other artists who are thinking, what am I going to do? What is my work trying to say? Mm. At that moment, you were kind of really moved to just investigate this further. Yeah. Can you say a bit more about the politics that in, informed you and how that's 
still at play today? Yeah, I mean, so um, around the... T well, I guess I started this body of work a little bit later after already having set up the collective. And mm -hmm. I set up the collective just through the pure frustrations of trying to make it in an art world that really wasn't open to me as one uh, a black female artist, but also a textile artist, because mm. it's only very recently that textiles has really been kind of included into the fine art canon. But also the fact that I was coming to it much later on in life. I kind of started in my late 20s, 30s. Um, and it's kind of all of those, you know, all those boxes I was ticking, you know, mm -hmm. race, age, gender, class, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of starting to have conversations with other black female artists and realizing that this isn't just my journey, but they're all experiencing it, whether they're self-taught or, you know, have amazed whatever, you know, they're all having that same experience. And so for me, it's always a thing of, okay, well, what can I do to create some kind of solution? Um, and I just thought maybe bringing in a collective of artists together we'll have a bigger voice to be able to kind of create a platform for ourselves, take some ownership, try and get some power back by us really doing together, um, and then just be a voice for other artists. And, you know, at the time, I had all these grand ideas about what I wanted the collective to do and to be, and I wanted to be able to set up mentorship programs. I wanted it to be open to all artists. But then the realities of, you know, to the world we live in. Mm -hmm. Yes, trying to juggle at the time, I was still working full time. Um, but also the fact that we didn't have resources. We, you know, I was funding it, self-funding it. And, you know, we got to a point then where the artists who were members were also contributing, you know, on a monthly basis. But for all the things that we wanted to do, there was just not the resource to be able to do that. And then we will have our own lives. And it just got to the point that, unfortunately, we weren't able to really realize all the things that we wanted to. But in our journey, when we were really active, we had some fantastic opportunities, mm -hmm. but also were able to really, you know, I got to speak on a number of panels and really voice the frustrations of also the fact at the time that people weren't really investing in black British art. It's only really now starting to happen. It was very much a focus on contemporary African art, even to the point where we got a partnership with a, a PR company who were trying to get us press and were literally being told, well, if it doesn't, if they're not an African collective, we have no interest. And it's like, you have so much talent here, but you just, you have no interest in it. And it's this kind of really just, kind of square box thinking, you know? Um, so potentially, I'm just going to move us on a little bit so we get to yeah. talk to, about your work. Yeah. But potentially then, the platform that brought us together into closer connection through ICF yes. was quite a turning point Absolutely. for you because that's kind of... It, corresponded with the same time that you were going deeper into the nude me and really exploring mm. that. Um, what's beautiful, another, well, one of the many elements of that um, series that's beautiful for me is that you center intergenerational black yes. female experiences through that work as well. Yeah. Um, I've got here an image. <laughs> you want to tell us who this image is? Oh. That beautiful person there is my mother who moved to the UK at 19 years old in the late 1960s. Like many Af other African and Caribbean women, she worked in the NHS. Um, and I mean, I don't know if many people know that, but basically after World War II, there was a huge drive in the British colonies um, to bring people over to help support the service industries because there'd been such a massive loss of life. Um, and so, so many men and women joined the National Health, Health Service working as nurses. And part of their uniform was they had to wear tights. And as you can see in this picture, which actually turned to black and white, so it's, you can see the stark contrast of those tights against my mother's skin colour. Um, and it's a thing where, you know, it's, you know, it's a pair of tights, what's the big deal? But it's this thing of always being othered, never you know, having that space where you're made to feel like you're of worth and you're of value. Basically, you're not important enough to have a pair of tights that matches your skin tone. Um, but for me, it was going even deeper than that and thinking about her experiences moving here at that time, working in the NHS through this 
body of work, it was the first time that I actually sat down with my mother and had a conversation about her experiences then and learning about the racism that she experienced both from the patients, her colleagues, and the fact that, and it's something that is just intrinsic to black women, that we always come from a place of care. And because when I started this body of work, I was looking at you know, the roots of tights, so as far back as stockings, and the fact that for the British Empire in the 17th, 18th century, you displayed your wealth mostly through fashion, through what you wore. And so you have all of men and women wearing stockings. You see it mostly in men because they had their portraits taken and they could display their legs. So you see them wearing stockings. Those stockings are either made from silk or cotton, cottons being grown on the plantation. So again, I'm thinking of, you know, these women work in the plantations, some of them having to look after their slave owners, children, and it's just always this thing of we are the foundations of all these empires. Literally, they've been built off the backs of black women, and yet they're never given space, they're never given voice, they're never given their thanks. All of these women moved to this country, left their families, and moved to this country and started new lives with no support systems apart from them coming together collectively as communities. And they still, you know, my mother doesn't really talk about those experiences. What she shared, I know, is just, you know, the, 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 the yeah, very tip of the, the iceberg. tip of the iceberg, you know. And so and then that also got me thinking about generational trauma and how that's passed down from generation to generation. Which is really beautifully represented here through the picture of this beautiful woman, young woman, because many of those women from the colonies who mm. came here wanting to replicate what they thought were standards of good progress and mm. opportunity for their young daughters, would send them to ballet school. Yeah. I was definitely one of those. I mean, <laughs> I, I said to my mum, I really want to go ballet because one of my neighbours went to, to study ballet. And then I get the outfit, and what colour is it? <laughs> <laughs> It's supposed to be skin tone, skin tone but skin yeah. tone is pink. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's so subtle. We're so kind of programmed to it that I don't think it would be naturally that obvious for anybody looking at it to think, well, something's really off there mm. because it's just been kind of made into the norm. But look at those legs. Look at the beautiful colour of her skin. And it just shows you that juxtaposition. So yeah. these women who've had to... Um, endure what they've endured, you know, working for the NHS mm. under s very challenging circumstances, then have these these children, mm. some, you know, daughters, and then have them have to shape shift as well and mm. fit these norms. Mm. Mm. So say a bit about why, for you, mm. the, the ballet example of, of the use of tights and obviously the mm. colour of the actual footwear as well mm. was quite poignant. It was really poignant for me because I just, you know, through the research and actually reading accounts from these ballet dancers about the fact that even when they're about to step on stage, they're having to sit there pancaking their tights, and they usually do it with foundation that matches their skin tone, and pancake their shoes when they should be stretching like, you know, their contemporaries are there kind of getting ready, getting into the right frame of mind. But it's also the fact that for them, because the, I, the whole idea of you know, having these flesh tone color tights is because when you're dancing, it creates this beautiful long line. But obviously it won't do that for someone of brown skin tone because it's not matching their skin tone. So it's all of these ways that very subtly you're told that you don't belong. You know, as well as the fact that sometimes you're told physically your body doesn't belong in the ballet space. So um, that really resonated for me um, because when I did find a pair of tights that match, match my skin tone, and this was with uh, my brand partner, Sheer Chemistry, who I collaborated on with since the beginning of this project, it was a really er emotional moment for me, and it made me realize how, how much we kind of just carry on and not realizing that all of these things chip away at us little by little by little, even a simple pair of tights can chip away at your self, your self, your self worth, your mm -hmm. identity, um, and and that's really why I make this work, you know, because it's a it's a way for me to talk about these really deep seated issues that we all carry as Black women, you know, and because it's so connected to my own journey of growth, of unlearning and relearning, and trying to really develop a sense of self worth that's outside of these Western canons of beauty and what, you know femininity is and all of those things 
and wanting for us collectively to have this moment of healing that will help, help us kind of curb this cycle of passing on these traumas. Um, that's what's central to it. Well, this is the perfect artwork then to yes. then speak about. Um, it's so interesting to see this artwork in this kind of constellation because it has taken many forms, mm. hasn't it? Mm. Um, let's you know, uh, get under the surface of how you actually went about creating this work. The word you get to use, but that is really central to your practice, is healing. Yeah. And you do talk about the actual craft of uh, creating kind of the meditative nature of repeating moves, mm -hmm. you know, um, whether it's sewing or knitting. Mm -hmm. um, there's something in that practice of really thinking about the letting go, the shedding, mm. that is transformative for you. Mm. So this piece of work came together over how many days? And oh my gosh. What kind of, yeah, time in your life? Can you tell us a bit more about just the context for the creation of this work? Yes. Which is entitled Invisibility Cloak. Invisibility Maybe. Cloak, yeah. So um, this is when I really started playing with the tights and actually knitting with them. This was actually the first work that I made that was knitted and I actually knitted it by hand without needles, so on my arm. Um, so it was very performative in itself as an act. Um, and I knew that I wanted to make this piece. So I already had the, the title Invisibility Cloak in mind because everything that we had just, we've just been talking about and thinking about this thing of us being invisible in so many ways. Um, you know, we've all had that experience of being told um, we look like some other black woman. Mm -hmm. Whitney. Yeah. <laughs> or being mistaken for some other yeah. black woman. And this thing of actually physically feeling invisible, yeah. you know, someone kind of, even just, I have so many instances of walking down the street and people expecting me to get out of their way. Mm. Just all these really subtle ways that we're made to feel like we don't belong, we're invisible, we're not worthy. Um, and this was actually the first, first piece I used in a performance. Um, I was invited, so through the ICF, through the International Curators Forum, my mentor was Professor Carol Tullock. And she encouraged me to do to apply for a conference, um, and so there was a call for abstracts. And I just kept thinking, as an artist, I don't want to do a death by PowerPoint presentation. I want the audience to be immersed in my work in some way. And so I developed this concept for a performance piece that would talk through the themes that I'd been exploring. So I created this story of four black women, and I tied it to my maternal line, so it was myself, my mother, my grandmother and great-grandmother, who I never met my grandmother, she died when my mum was really young. Um, you know, my mum doesn't really know much about her mother because for one, you know, very traditionally with African um, families or Ghanaian families, you didn't have that kind of friendship thing. You, you know, children were seen and not heard. So she didn't really know much about, you know, her mother's life before she was a mother and same for, the, for my great grandmother. And so I was really interested in kind of exploring those stories without really knowing much about them. But it also was interesting that their birth dates kind of tied in with some of the key dates I was exploring, like the 1800s, um, my mother being born in 1944 and then moving here in 1960s, so thinking of the Windrush era. Um, and so basically it was, you know, this story of a slave girl on a plantation finding a doll um, that had these really beautiful white silk stockings and putting them against her skin and comparing them and thinking that she was worthless because she was so dark compared to this doll. Um, and that was inspired by a doll I actually found in the V&A archives mm. and that belonged to a family called the Cockrell family who were tied to the slave trade. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so in this performance, I'm wearing the cloak and then at one point I throw it off in an act of reclamation of my own beauty and kind of womanhood. Um, and it was very different to the performances I do now. It was very kind of basic in comparison. Um, but what I did have was this washing line that I then put up some of my artworks. And that was, again, the reference to black women always work in these kind of roles of servitude, but being kind of the pillars and foundations of empire. 
I just want to acknowledge you for taking that step in the first place. I mean, talk about basic and then you unravel all these layers of meaning. <laughs> it doesn't sound that basic to me. And prior to that, you hadn't performed. No, no. And if you'd asked me, like when we first met, I'd be like, no way, never. Exactly. So what, what, sh what changed? I think it was just the fact that everything that I was exploring through the work, I felt like there was something else I needed to say that the artworks couldn't say, and I needed this kind of performative act to do that. And, you know, you've seen my performance. I've definitely grown with the scope and what I'm doing, you know, with my body in, you know, my performance work. And it's this thing of it's just being completely vulnerable in these intimate spaces. And I feel like there's just such a powerful thing that happens, even for me, myself, as a performer in that space, something kind of takes over me. Um, we'll, hopefully we'll talk about a performance I did with Liz Gray, where we both said that we felt the ancestors channeling through us, and it becomes a thing of you're very much a vessel. You know, you're outside of yourself. Um, and again, that's central to the work I'm trying to do when I'm thinking about healing, when I'm thinking about healing us collectively. Those are the things that need to occur. We need to address our past. We need to have these conversations with our ancestors to be able to let go and move forward. Very much so. And I'd like to also bring into the conversation some of your artistic influences. So mm. the obvious one is Sengen and Goody, yes. um, who I believe was also coming more into your life, not only through research, but also for a personal relationship at this time. Can you yes. say a bit about that and how researching her practice and her approach to collective work also mm. and performance mm. influenced the journey. So again, I have to thank the International Curators Forum because they um, put together a talk with Sengen and Goody and Linda Good Bryant when they were in town for um, the, oh, what was the exhibition? Soul of, Soul Soul of the Nation. Nation. Um, and so, I went back and I researched Sengen and Goody, and then I see her practice and her work with tights and her performance. I'm like, oh my goodness. At this point, I'd already started this body of work, but I'd never heard of her as an artist. And just all the kind of commonalities, the fact that her work is deeply rooted in spirituality, in African spirituality, in Southeast Asian spirituality, in the fact that it also talks about healing, um, and that the performative acts are kind of creating those spaces. And I was just so taken by it. And then obviously we got to meet her and you know, she's just such an auntie. She's just so warm and just even in her embrace, you feel healed, you know? Um, but then again, through the ICF, they invited me to then do a performance where I activated one of her pieces, Sand Mining. And this was her first kind of retrospective um, exhibition in the UK at Henry Moore Institute. And so getting her blessing, first of all, to do that, um, and then having the opportunity to perform with her work, it was almost like the baton was being handed down. And ever since then, we've, you know, kept in contact. You know, we were trying to um, put together a project, which unfortunately hasn't come to fruition. But, you know, we've had these really beautiful conversations. And it, again, it just kind of reinforces how important those intergenerational conversations are because the exchange has just been so beautiful and we've learned so much from each other and having that kind of relationship. Um, and I've got two other pieces of work here that from the, the Nude Me Under the Skin series that also, I mean, they're distinctly your voice, but they also evoke the, some of the uh, aesthetics of Senga's practice. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit about both of these pieces of work which are on display downstairs? Are, people yeah. had a chance to have a look. But if you're online, please, you must make sure you come here and have a look <laughs> at these amazing works in conversation with the other pieces um, over the, that she's produced over the last 10 years or so. Um, so the first piece on the frame, A Colonialist Ravelry. So the titles often kind of give you a sense of what um, I'm trying to explore in the work. So this work is called Colonious Ravelry, an infection of mind, skin and being. Blackness hangs on a determined survival. And so around this time, I had started making works that were really exploring this idea of empire. Some of them kind of were emulating the British flag. Um, and I was just thinking about the fact that this tiny island was able to kind of conquer much of the world. 
um, and kind of instill its ideas of society, of patriarchy, of you know culture, and really trying to erase everything that we are as you know as as Africans and. So the idea of having this kind of sliver of black knitting on the side with these kind of ties stretching out is this idea of diaspora and the fact that, you know, we're, we're still hanging on. There's still these kind of interconnected threads, whether you're in the Caribbean, whether you're, you know, of African descent, whether you're in, you know, um, South America. There's these things that through the music, through the dance, through the food still connect us back to our root. Um, and so no matter how much has, you know, has been erased or has attempted to be erased, there's still that commonality that kind of connects us all. Um, and then the, the kind of circular piece, cyclical vein concentric growth, I actually made while I was on residency at um, Blackrock, Senegal. Um, and there I was really, again, taken by the natural landscapes, which, you know, we'll talk more about in the new body of work, Delu. Um, but they have these magnificent baobab trees that are eons old um, and they have so much kind of spirituality. The griots are often buried in them and I was thinking about how tree rings tell the life of the tree. And so thinking about that in terms of us as black women and thinking of us historically, I was just thinking about how again, you know, these Western beauty ideals, all of these kind of constructs that kind of try and box us into something that we're not. But at the root of it, you know, at the heart of it, in ourselves, in our souls, if we go within, we will find ourselves again. Mm -hmm. And so right in the center core is this kind of brown tie that is kind of stripped around the piece. And it's this idea of kind of going back to that center. Um, and then you've got these kind of pieces of the nude tie that are kind of burnt through and lace, and it's this idea of, you know, these empirical structures still trying to kind of, you know, tear at us and, and break us apart. But at the root, at the centre of us, we're, you know, we're still whole. I'm just going to let you speak. <laughs> 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 I spoke so much at the beginning, and it's just so powerful to hear you speak so articulately about what, concepts are you're thinking about as you're mm. creating the work and they speak so loudly so um, tell us also about this work which is called what lies beneath um, you can see I mean immediately because there's kind of two layers to this work mm. what you may be um, alluding to particularly because you've got that the different forms of the darker hosiery material mm. on the top being distressed, pulled mm. by by different threads across the top, and mm. then with a nude, with different kind of variations of nude mm. um, hosiery underneath, been having been woven together, knitted and then woven together. Mm. But yes, please tell us a bit about this piece and how it came about in the context within which it was created in 2021, as we were just coming out of. <laughs> of COVID, yeah. Um, so this piece I made after the Rest in Blackface piece, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and so it's very much informed by that because they're very similar in how I've made them. Um, but again, like I was saying before, I was thinking about these ideas of empire and kind of making pieces that emulated flags. And so this was very much one of those works. But it's also, so the full title is What Lies Beneath Empire's Dark History Revealed. So it's basically a symbolic, kind of um, artwork that talks about how Britain likes to brush things under the carpet. So the piece that's upturned is the dirty dark secrets under the carpet coming to the fore. Um, and then they're being pulled to the front at the top and they're burnt through. So when I started working with black tights, and I was working with black tights because traditionally that's what we've worn as black women, um, and just being inspired by the fact that you ladder your tights, right? And I was thinking about how that is such a, a kind of a good way of talking about how we as black women feel so drained and broken down and tired with all of the things that are kind of we're battling against on a daily basis. So I started kind of burning through the tights because of that and then kind of embroidering over the top and the embroidery, I do just a basic kind of chain stitch embroidery because it looks like the shape of the blood vessels. Um, and the, 
body of work nude me under the skin the under the skin part is basically saying underneath it all we're all the same we have the same you know ecosystem as does the natural world plant life that brings the life force that helps us navigate this planet and the fact that no matter your skin color you know where you're from in the world we are all universally aligned you know underneath it all on a deep energy spiritual level um, and so for us to kind of as a humanity try and remember that um, and so that's kind of interlaced throughout all the works um, but with this one specifically it is kind of you know the British Empire's kind of dirty secrets are being brought to the surface. So from there let's get into how you've activated these works mm. in performance we've already talked a little bit about it but We've now can see here the invisibility. Well, no, this is the Oculus, the third eye. Yeah. Similar to, but yes. uh, similar to, and maybe yeah. the kind of precursor to uh, the invisibility cloak being the precursor to this work, yeah. which so poignantly brought into everybody's consciousness through the Venice Biennale yeah. um, performance. So yeah. tell us about how you approached that performance because this was the first time for you to bring that way of activating, you know, this kind of sculptural piece mm. uh, for a live audience, mm. a, a larger wide audience. Yeah. So I'd already kind of written the proposal for this performance before I was approached to do so because for the Henry Moore Institute performance, I wrote two proposals of different performances I could do to activate Senga's work and they chose the one that I, I did and so but I really wanted to realize this because I thought that this was also really powerful um, and it was informed by the first performance where again I was referencing my matrilineal line so for a while with my performances I was always performing with having these kind of four corners and they were supposed to signify myself my mother my grandmother and my great-grandmother mm. Um, and so for this piece, so I made this piece again by knitting on my arm because it's so massive um, and I very much had the idea of this oculus that I would perform in the centre of but have these kind of four points which were bricks that had tights tied to them and they became these harnesses that I would wrap around my arms and my feet and they almost became like harnesses and because of the way I moved with them at some points it's almost like I'm constricted like I've got kind of chains around my arms and my feet um, and I have this audio monologue, which is the same one that I'd recorded for my very first performance that's talking through these stories of the woman that's on the plantation, the woman that is working on the nurse's ward, and then myself. Um, and so I'm kind of playing out these different stories as they're being told or the audience are hearing them. Um, and this was really kind of where I centered the idea of opening up a portal to the ancestors, having this conversation, learning from them and bringing that learning through to the present as a way of providing a space for us to heal. And so that was very much what that performance was about. As you said, that experience was transformative, not because you were just bringing it into life, but because you were kind of summoning essentially ancestral knowledge mm. through your body mm. and realizing new insights mm. into what those experiences historically into the present really uh, the weight of those what they really signified and the poignancy of wanting to transform that for you know um, a future of more equity mm. um, freedom mm. Can you say a bit more about how you personally experienced that? Because I remember you being quite overwhelmed <laughs> by that and um, yeah, how you processed that experience. Mm. It, yeah, it's a thing where I think after this performance and a uh, performance I did in Marrakesh, I actually then started every, before every performance having this kind of meditative moment where I'm kind of summoning my, my ancestors because in the Marrakesh performance I had this real kind of epiphany moment where as I was performing against these posts that are supposed to signify my grandmother and great grandmother, I had this realization that even though I don't know their stories, I, I, you know, I never met my grandmother, 
their spirit lies within me because I am their child, you know, their DNA lies within me and I can channel into that and channel that strength, channel their power, channel their, their, their love, their laughter, their joy, like their spirit essentially. Um, and, you know, I've always talked about how this work is so tied to my own journey of healing and growth and, and every performance has created space for that for me. Um, and then I think it's also the conversations I have after those performances with the audience and seeing how they connect to it and how it's moved them in a way or it's made triggered a memory in them or in some way, shape or form, it's had the kind of effect that I want it to have, you know? And I think for me, that's so humbling because my work really is about creating space for us all to heal. Um, and it's... It just, it just, it kind of motivates me to do more um, because performance is really taxing. It's emotionally, mentally, spiritually taxing. Um, but I feel like it's something that I was called to do. I think I talk about it even in my statement that, you know, as an Ewe, I'm from the Ewe tribe in Ghana, and we are storytellers, we are weavers, and so the fact that that is what I do as my practice, it's my calling, is what I was meant to do. Um, and, you know, that weight and that responsibility, you know, it's, it, it does weigh on you, but in the same vein, it's also really rewarding. Which brings me to this piece. <laughs> um, it's so powerful because at a time when we were all, you know, not because we chose to, but because it was the best for our safety and we've been told by authorities that we should stay at home, um, you were weaving and creating <laughs> this um, piece of work as part of your own personal healing, but then got transmitted across the globe <laughs> um, as a, a tool for global healing and reflection. Um, so this piece is called Resting Black Base, yeah. made in 2020 during lockdown and so powerfully activated um, through a performance. Um, so yeah, let's, I'm gonna take us to a picture of mm. the performance because I think as soon as you start to look at these images, you get a sense of <laughs> what that might have felt like. Is the link to this performance still live? On it is, Tate's yeah, website? yeah so on YouTube, yeah. Something for you all to look into. So it's, the performance was called We Invoke the Black to Rest. Um, it took place at Tate Britain during 2020. The artist that is also the other artist in this um, collage of images is Liz Gray, Gray. Um, composer, uh, well, a multidisciplinary artist. Mm. She expresses her, her work through many, many forms, but especially through music mm. and singing and composition. Yeah. Tell us about how this opportunity came to play and then how the work was activated in there. There, we can see it um, on the floor. At the end of the performance, you're both um, kind of kneeling upon it. Mm. But I know there's many other possibilities and mm. other ways in which um, it's supposed to open up possibilities. So please, <laughs> tell us um, more about that. So, so yeah, we were both invited by the then public programs curator Peju Oshin, who is now associate director at Gargosian, um, to yeah, create a, a live performance or live stream performance that was activating Lynette Yardenbache's incredible, incredible exhibition. And Lynette is someone that is just, I, I'm just, yeah, I, I'm super fangirl <laughs> of Lynette's work. Um, and I hadn't worked with Liz before. Um, we were, you know, we knew each other, but had never worked together before. Um, and from the very first meeting, just, the things that we had been thinking about individually and then coming together and realizing that we were on the same wavelength it was just 
such a beautiful kind of project to do from beginning to end because we we both come from the same kind of space of wanting to create space for black women to heal um, and she is very much also someone that works with community engagement and really brings the women into the process of making her work so um, that was kind of central to what we did here in that she created this beautiful um, soundscape that we worked with the Take Collective members um, and we had this kind of really a kind of open forum discussion around rest and you know the the challenging relationship we all have with this idea of rest especially you know in you know this modern world where it's all about you know the hustle and and there was a lot of conversations around covid time about oh now's your time to do to work on your hustle project or whatever um when we're like actually this is a moment for rest for reflection you know um and you know, side note is kind of, I was talking to someone just yesterday about how sad it is that everything's just gone right back to how it was before COVID. Um, but so, yeah, anyway, going back to this project. So um, we basically wanted to create something that, again, was a portal to the ancestors, but also really connected communally to everything that we were going through through COVID. Um, but also, you know, everything that had, you know, through that summer Black Lives Matter movement, there was so much kind of discussion around the violence towards black bodies um, and how collectively it had been so stressful for us process processing that through that time of COVID, which was already stressful. Um, and all the kind of emotions that brought forth for the black community specifically. Um, and so that was kind of at the heart of um, the performance um, and we actually started the performance being in completely different spaces within the exhibition and then I am just responding to the soundscape and Liz's voice so she was also singing live um, through the performance um, and there were some really beautiful moments within that performance that we both felt transported there was a moment so actually in one of our conversations we came up with this line, ooh, child. And so I'm, you know, she's like the maternal figure and I'm the child and I'm responding to her as she's saying it. Um, and my movement in all my performances is very organic. It's how I'm feeling in that moment. And there's something about Liz's voice that really my body responds to in this really beautiful way. Um, and so, the, yeah, the performance, it was just a very spiritual experience for the both of us. And like I said before, we felt like we were vessels, especially this moment when we both come to kind of sit on the blanket. And so I'd actually started making this piece before I was invited to do the performance. And so it was perfect because I was making this blanket thinking about these ideas of rest and comfort. Um, and so, you know, this idea of us now coming together to kind of rest on this this blanket and it's this idea of the energy that has been transported through us being kind of injected into the blanket. Um, it's something I haven't talked about yet, but I also really think about material on an energy level and the fact that everything comes down to an atomic level. And so all the clothes that we wear um, as we move through our day, they kind of soak up the emotions and everything that we're feeling and thinking. Um, and so in some of the work, it becomes a voice for the voiceless, like when I'm making the works around the NHS nurses. And for pieces like this, it's about the energy and that spiritual kind of awakening that we're having kind of being embedded into that piece. And so that piece now being an active kind of healing agent. And another dimension of that, that I think is poignant as we go into the other kind of new chapter of your work that comes from this in terms of performance film is how not only are you injecting energy into the material that you're activating, but also in, into the way people understand the environment that mm. you're working within. And here you're providing this performance within Tate Britain mm. and all those challenging histories of colonialism, yeah. um, the way art has been perceived. Obviously, it's just amplified by the fact that you're in response to <laughs> one of our best artists, yes. Annette Yadonbarachi, also a fellow Ghana girl, uh -huh. um, <laughs> in the space. There's a really powerful, multi-layered yeah. yeah. way to kind of 
challenge yeah. the, the history and the way in which Tate Britain under, is understood. Mm. So you go from that seat of power mm. in the art world <laughs> yes. to <laughs> yes. the seat of power in the city? Yes, so Two Temple Place, yeah, in the city. Um, so actually, Two Temple Place is a beautiful, beautiful building. Um, and it was actually built by um, an uh, American migrant, I forget his name now, apologies, who moved to the UK and so built this kind of, you know, palatial home because he was trying to kind of inject himself into the British elite and so felt he needed this really ostentatious home. And it's just absolutely stunning. He basically commissioned the best kind of um, uh, cross people to uh, create this space. So all the wood panelling, there's these really gorgeous kind of um, wooden sculptures in the atrium of all these different kind of Shakespearean characters. You've got the stained glass windows. It's just, it's a really beautiful space. Um, but again, it was, for me, um, there's a real thing about architecture when it comes to the performances that I do, because a lot of the time, like I've performed in Christie's, it's all these spaces that, you know, normally we don't see ourselves being... Elite, it, exactly, exclusive. Exactly, it, we don't feel like we could, you know, you know exist in these spaces. Um, and with this film, I'm very much saying, you know, here I am, this small little black body, you know, uh, I perform in, you know, this nude kind of um, performance where, so it's this kind of idea of this kind of naked black body in this vast, like, you know, empirical space. And yet I'm here and I'm taking up space and I have every right to because, you know, it's the blood of our ancestors that built these spaces. And so I have every right to exist. I have every right to claim it as my own. And I will do so in my fullest self, embracing my Ewe background. I speak Ewe in the film. I'm dancing traditional Ewe dance called Agbaja, which actually is really beautiful because that central centers healing as well. And this, in the way that you move, this kind of convex, concave, way of moving your body that brings life force, brings air, oxygen back into your body as a way of healing your body. Um, and so for me, I mean, this was my first performance film and it was just, it was so beautiful and so emotional for me. Um, and again, working with this really amazing director, Freddie Layden, who is one of my constant collaborators when it comes to film, um, who makes these amazing art films anyway. He just, he gets it. And so we're just a really great force kind of working together on these films. Can you say something about the lighting? Yes, <laughs> yes. So the space in itself is very moody. It's, you know, you can imagine it's like all this dark wood. It's very kind of dark. And obviously, Freddie is just a genius in how he wants, you know, my skin to be lit in the film and then also with the colour grading. And it was very much this idea, especially in the rooms that have all the wood panelling, of playing with, the, you know, my skin tone against all of these natural kind of elements that are within this space and kind of having that conversation with them. And it's something that's kind of carried through when we go to the next film as well. So we're inching closer and closer into the very heart of power, yes. historically, yes. in the city. So this is in Guildhall. Yes. So this actually was a live performance that was commissioned by um, an organisation called Arts and Heritage um, for a celebratory event that they had um, in 2022, I believe it was, yes. Um, and then they wanted us to have some kind of lasting documentation of it. Um, and we thought it would be much better to create a film than to try and film the live performance on the night. Um, and so we went back and, and basically did a film adaptation of the live performance. Um, and basically I was commissioned to do this performance. The only directive I was given was that it had to be a space in London and they just wanted me to create a performance that you know, explored all the themes that I explore through my work. Um, and so I was researching sites and then landed on London Guild Hall because I came across the Zong case. So the Zong was a Dutch slave ship that was actually stolen by the British. The Zong, so Zong in Dutch actually means care, which I found really interesting. Um, it was stolen by um, the British. It docked in Ghana, so there was a direct link to, to my heritage, loaded with um, people, and then on its kind of passage, they threw 133 enslaved people overboard. 
Um, there are different stories as to why. Um, they were saying that they got lost and didn't have enough water, so they had to throw some of the enslaved overboard. No one really knows the true story. But the reason why this is so poignant is because when they returned to Britain, they then tried to claim insurance for those enslaved people, and it was £30 per person. So basically, they were claiming loss of property, and that case was tried at the Guildhall in the Great Hall, which is the room like in the top um, space where you see both Liz and I. And so I found that really poignant. Um, but also the fact that the Guildhall is where all the London mayors would meet. Many of them were plantation owners. There's a statue of... I forget his name, but he's known as the King of Jamaica because he owns so many plantations in Jamaica. Um, there's a stained glass win window of Samuel um, Pepys, who was this diarist that you know was lauded for kind of basically having this historical document of London, you know, in that era, but also you know was a shareholder in the Royal Africa Company. So. For me, it was a way for us to not only highlight all of these things that people don't really know about, but also for us, it was a way for us to lay those souls that were thrown overboard to rest. There are so many, there's this kind of Drexian, Drexian theory about the mothers who are thrown overboard from those slave ships somehow being able to survive and their children surviving underwater. But for me, for this piece, it was about laying those souls to rest because so many of them have not found peace because mm. of the way that, you know, they died. And reclaiming our presence in those spaces. Sorry, say again? And reclaiming our presence and reclaiming, yes, in those spaces. In those spaces. I think one of the poignant things also to mention, and the film you can see downstairs, um, is that one of the songs I picked specifically, I wanted Liz to sing um, African American spirituals. One of them is very poignant because Amazing Grace was actually written by a British reverend who wrote that song to absolve himself of his sins because he was a slave trader. His past was that he was involved in the slave trade. Um, and the fact that it's, you know, it is known, it is a well-known kind of African-American spiritual, I thought that it was just very interesting because I don't know if many people know the root of that song. It's true. But I just love the way that you've progressed into creating all these different approaches to archiving, but film, which, you know, will live on and on. Mm as a way to empower future generations. But then we're speaking now about the passage over you know, the Atlantic and uh, the kind of the histories that have come forth from the um, transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. And it brings us directly into conversation with that turning point when you got the news that you had mm -hmm. won um, a place on this prestigious res residency mm -hmm. um, in 2022 to go to Senegal yeah. um, to be part of the Black Rock residency. Yeah. And this opened up an opportunity to, to go back to the yes. motherland yes. Uh, and uh, specifically Senegal and start mm -hmm. to excavate some of these histories and mm -hmm. delve deeper into some of the knowledge that is embedded in those um, mm -hmm. cultures there. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to the commission yes. here, yeah. Delu, the retour, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the return. The return. Um, so yeah, act two. <laughs> <laughs> With 10 minutes to go of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it just shows you how much work you've done and, um, <laughs> to get to this point. So tell us about yeah, your, your experience of the Black Rock residency, yes. which you were on for how many months? For two months. Two months. Two months, yeah. That's yeah. a significant chunk it, of time. It is, it is. With it other is. amazing creatives Artists. across mm. various different disciplines. Mm. All African American. Uh, so oh, of no, the African diaspora. Of African diaspora. diaspora. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was such a beautiful experience. Um, like you say, uh, you know, a lot of it was just the conversations I had with the artists. So the time that I was there, there was an African American artist. There was an artist who's based in Ethiopia. Um, so you have three artists together at a time. Um, I came a bit later, so they left and new artists came in. Then there was a Nigerian artist and another African-American filmmaker. Um, and it was just nice to have these conversations, especially being diaspora from different parts of the world and 
kind of now beginning to understand each other's experiences, like especially for the African American artists, really learning about our Black British experience, mm. about the African experience. It was really, really beautiful. And then also just the experience of the residency itself, being in Senegal, which is the most beautiful country, very different to Ghana and very similar in some ways, but just the landscapes, the sky, I cannot get over the sky, like the skyscapes were just so atmospheric and beautiful. I've never seen such a thing, terracotta, and these, these colors informed the work. Um, and it was, this, again, that tie-in of going back to nature and having nature inform the work because, you know, I'm always talking about nature's healing properties. Um, and, and then this space, which is so key to the film that you'll see downstairs, um, the Theatre de Longuma in Tubab Dialao, which is about two hours' drive from Dakar. Um, and so I have to... I, I talked about her yesterday Nayet Mbaye, who is the producer at Black Rock Senegal, and basically facilitates our whole experience as artists. So I told her that, you know, having been there, having just won this prize, I knew that I really wanted to make a film for this body of work. And I wanted something that was just mind blowing as a space. And she was like, I know the place. And she took us to, to Bab Dialao. And so without her, I wouldn't have known this place existed. And it was it's so core to, to the film. Tell and us it's, about the history. Of the so space. it's an artist, it, it was actually an artist residency space. Um, and so the um, the man that built it also has another space kind of into Bab Dialao, which is more kind of a cultural center. Um, and so the idea is that people can come, it's a place for rest, it's mainly for people that kind of have holistic practices so yoga and those kinds of things but it's in this expansive kind of land with a beautiful forest there's monkeys in the trees it's just so beautiful and serene and in the film there are parts where you hear kind of the nature you know uh, um, in the sound design um, yeah it's just such a beautiful space so so yes the film yes <laughs> So it's very much informed by African spirituality, yeah. specific to the region of yeah. Senegal that you yeah. are in. Um, and it was, like you said, a real opportunity for you to get a broader insight into the range of um, narratives and perspectives on African spirituality that exist within Western Africa, yeah. obviously being of ever um, heritage. Mm. You know, you have your own practices, your own rituals. Yeah. And so it was quite, you've described to me in conversation, as it was really eye-opening mm. to then learn about the specific experiences of Senegalese women yeah. from the local area yeah. and how they have um, processed their experiences mm. of colonialism mm. and sought power mm. through the maintenance of their kind of traditional spiritual yeah. Yeah. rituals. Yeah. And that's very much informed um, this work. Yes. With significant reference to uh, Lingir of Wallo and yes. Queen Ndate Yala Mbodj. Yes. I can, so that compared to I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly yeah, the not authority, the but yeah. <laughs> Apologies to our Senegalese <laughs> sisters out there. Um, but yeah, no, um, uh, yeah it was an opportunity for me to really delve deep and learn much more about the colonization of Senegal in terms of the French, because I didn't really know, I knew the basics, I didn't really know much. So to be able to kind of delve deeper into, into that, but I really obviously wanted to highlight, you know, key women in their history. Um, and I came across the story of Queen Ndate, who um, was the leader of a community, she's of uh, Sera religion, um, and she was, you know, uh, a force, a tour de force, and was able to kind of bat off, you know, Portuguese colonizers, the French colonizers for, you know, a good chunk of time. And I really wanted to tap into that through the work, tap into her strength. And, you know, I can only imagine, I was talking about the fact that, you know, their weaponry, you know, against, you know, these kind of colonial powers, being able to fight that off is a huge feat, you know, and there's um, some letters that exist in one of the university archives of, you know, that even just 
the, her tone of phrase when she's kind of writing to, you know, the king. It's just, I, I just really wanted to tap into that through the work and through the film. Um, because obviously, you know, um, Senegal having had this kind of colonial power over them for centuries, again, it's a very patriarchal society now. And so women don't have, you know, the, the freedoms that they had. Um, and, you know, I was obviously very aware that I'm not Senegalese, I'm a Ghanaian woman coming into this space. But I just, you know, I really, the women that I connected with, they just have so much grace, um, so much power, and, you know, come with such joy. I think I was telling you about experience I had with a community of women from a de domestic abuse centre, and through everything that they've been through, they just had so much warmth and, and, and joy and really connected and held each other up. And so I wanted to kind of tap into that as well in the film and really, again, create a space for them to reclaim um, their power. And boy, did you tap into that energy. <laughs> when I looked at the film, I, I, was, <laughs> I was so shocked by what was reflecting back at me through your kind of personhood you had transformed mm. you know you look at this image on the left and you see a, a serious woman yes <laughs> you know how can you be relaxed but about it and you mm. know not to mess with her mm. just by the way that she's holding her body upward yes one arm rested on her lap the <laughs> other one holding elegantly but assertively mm. you know a pipe mm. And just in these regal, beautiful colours, you mm. know that she's a woman of authority. Mm. Um, and yeah, you don't have to be smiling to yeah. know who you are yeah. all the time. And yeah, the gestures that you um, display in the film, you know, the expression on your face mm. is, yeah, it's serious mm. in a way that is so empowering. Um, but we can't go there yet without talking about other kind of symbols of of that power yeah. um, that's also evident. Mm. So here we have the decoration. Yes. Yeah. Really beautiful, ornate beads that you are inspired by. Mm. Yeah, so the cowrie shells in particular. Um, and so cowrie shells have a, a real importance across Africa. In many countries, including Ghana, we would use cowrie shells as you know our monetary system. Um, um, but I learned about this kind of um, culture of divination, which still continues to this day in Senegal, mostly with women, um, and they would go to kind of their, you know, their local kind of spiritual guide who would cast the cowrie shells and that, you know, tell them, you know, give them advice on a particular um, kind of situation. And so it's so kind of key to um, their life now. Um, and also just really interesting. Um, like most African countries that kind of push and pull between, you know, Islam and then their kind of traditional beliefs um, and kind of there's a lot of kind of battle between those two things which came across very much so in the kind of the stories around divination. Um, I was also really taken by Kankurang which informed the costumes as well um, that I wore in the performance and also the artworks. Um, and that I was really taken by, one, for the costumes and the way they move and the dancing in that ceremony, but also because I actually got to experience it myself mm. and learnt that, so this ceremony is to um, kind of celebrate newborn baby, newborn baby boys um, and women aren't allowed to take part in the process. And so when the kankarang actually come, we all have to run and hide in the houses while all the men are outside kind of taking part. And again, it was just this kind of very real display of othering women and this kind of idea of patriarchy. And so I really wanted to kind of reclaim that by wearing costumes that in a sense kind of evoking that and, try and doing kind of some of those kind of movements. Um, and then also underneath it all, there's a, a, a kind of a way of um, talking about 
sustainability in their environment. Um, and here I'm really talking about waste colonization because it directly affects the global south and very much across Africa. Uh, you know, I know about it very much in Ghana and so learning that, you know, it's also an issue in Senegal. This is one of the markets where basically all the secondhand clothing that we send to charity shops ends up across Africa. If it's not in these markets, then it's in landfill. It's a huge issue, environmental issue. Um, and so I wanted to document that in some way. And so much of the artworks and the costumes are made from used bed sheets that I got in Senegal. Um, and then the indigo ones actually had dyed by uh, an indigo dye who was a woman as well, which was really beautiful. OK, we're coming to the end. Mm. Good talk and talk and talk. I know. <laughs> but let's just get an insight into the process of creating the magic of the film. Yeah, so these are just some kind of behind the scenes. Um, I also included a little bit of the making of one of the artworks at the top in my little studio in Croydon. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is very much mostly the film. So that's a picture of Paviso in the top, who is this incredible drummer. So he laid down the drumming that was used in the film and in the sound design. And actually, when I was making the film, we actually used the kind of raw um, recordings of his drumming um, that I danced to for the film, and that's just them in the recording studio kind of finessing the film, and then behind the scenes of the making of the film. So I did like really intensive um, dance classes to try and infuse some of the traditional Saba dance moves into the, the film performance as well. Um, and then this is at um, the beach in Dakar. So I was very lucky that Black Rock Senegal is named Black Rock because it's on the beach where all the Black Rocks are. So we were able to kind of film there, which is, was really beautiful. And then obviously Theatre Languma. Um, and so that pathway is literally just outside the entrance to the theatre. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> So big thanks to Musa Inday for uh, his incredible instruction. It's amazing to see this. <laughs> Tell us, have you trained professionally in I dance? Have, not. have you ever done ballet, no. anything? No, okay. no, no. I would say that the only thing I think that helps me is that um, I did martial arts for a long time. I've kind of gone back to martial arts now and, and I dance salsa and just, you know, we just, we're just we joyful dance people, aren't we? So yeah, we, we love the dance. <laughs> I'd love to do a sub class with you, actually. Oh, it's so That's much something fun. we're going to get into. Yeah. I, don't, I think I'll be ruined by the end of it, but <laughs> something fun to do. And then we can finish up this part of the conversation just by looking at some of the beautiful artworks that mm. are the result of everything that you produce to create the film. Yeah. So here we have you using those cowrie shells yeah. and one of the costumes that yeah. you used. Yeah. It's um, called, yep, go ahead. Uh, so, it, so yeah, this is one of the costumes from the film. And so the artworks, as I said, really informed by the color of the, the landscapes and the nature that I experienced in Senegal. And so they're either named Hob, which means plant in Wolof, or suf, which means earth. Um, and now the last one has, has got ndo, which is water in Wolof. Um, and so um, the colorways are this kind of ivory, the kind of reddish terracotta, and then that beautiful indigo. Um, and so this piece, suf alter one, so the idea is that in the film, the person that I embody, Adama, is this gatekeeper who's been sent to, back to Senegal by the ancestral mothers to perform this kind of ritual act that kind of vibrates across Senegal to all the ancestral mothers' daughters to empower them and help them kind of reclaim themselves. And so these artworks that you see downstairs are supposed to be the vestiges of this performance. So these are altar pieces that Adama leaves behind so that their daughters have somewhere to go back to, to find solace, to find peace, to find healing, and to give praise to the mothers. Perfect note to end on. <laughs> I just want to say a huge thank you to you, you for bringing these beautiful works to life. They certainly are works that we can reflect upon for peace, for solace, and for power. And we, boy, do we need it in this time in society. Um, 
So I'd like to, well, shall we round of applause for Inam? Thank you. Congratulations on an incredible you. body of work and this Thank show. You. Everybody, please come and see it. Um, reflect upon it, spread the word. And now I'd like to open up to any questions that may be in our audience. Yes. The significance of the um, the wooden pieces that the, the artworks are hanging from? So those are all antique French pediments. So I wanted something to refer back to the French Empire and the colonizer that you know affected these women through centuries. And then the idea of these kind of altar pieces hanging off of these pediments is this idea, because you see with a lot of them, they're kind of roped around the pediments, and it's this idea of you know, these altars actually being a way of undoing all of the harm that colonization has kind of bestowed on these women. So it was really important for me to have that little kind of reference to the root of, you know, the, the things that have led to the way that these Senegalese women have to mm. live now. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pamia Banjoko, and I'm a, an artist. I'm a writer and a poet. Mm -hmm. I'm also the founder of Nottingham Black Archives. So I really, uh, your work around archives is, is, is really interesting to me. Um, I want to ask. So uh, you talked about the uh, 133 people, uh, enslaved people, thrown off the ship, and mm. their stories may never be known. We mm. don't exactly no. Uh, I've just completed a, a, a four-year intensive piece of study looking at um, the black literary history here in Nottingham mm. and there were gaps, lots of gaps and, and what I did as a poet is I imagined my way mm. over those gaps yeah. and, and I'm wondering if you do the same in your work. Yeah, absolutely um, and I think especially when you know, I was looking at it through the lens of the stories of my grandmother and great-grandmother that I don't know. We only have these kind of snippets of information, but just very much thinking about my personality, about my mother's personality, and how those things are both learnt but also passed down. Um, and I think so much about how we exist is because there's so much that we don't know that we kind of create, you know, so um, someone was saying to me that they thought the story that I had written was actually a true kind of, you know, um, a true story or like a kind of, you know, spiritual fable that had been passed down. And I was like, no, but it's a thing of us being able to imagine what's not there. And I think that's something that is so special, especially about being a creative. That's what we do on a daily basis um, is create, you know, magic and in a way um, create these stories um, mm -hmm. and that's the root of kind of every artistic output is kind of creating a story and for us as well it's there's so many things that because we don't know we have to create to fill those holes and fill those gaps and that's why so much of the beauty in our, our music and our dance comes from you know you think about how um the myths within, like Toni Morrison's Beloved, yes, how they yeah. help us navigate, make us understand the past, but also help us na navigate the present. Yeah. Um, they are influenced by what we know happened, mm. but they are myths. But mm. <laughs> as time goes on, they become more and more real. So yeah, yeah. yeah. really powerful that you do that. Mm -hmm. And we must talk. Yeah. <laughs> Black Cultural <laughs> Archives owes a lot to the people of Nottingham, as you, mm. you, I'm sure you even know of Len. Of course, good, okay. <laughs> yes, hello. Yes, you mentioned your, your Ebe heritage yeah. and um, the weaving mm. thing that, um, that uh, your people do. I wondered how, how that affected your um, work. Um, obviously, you do weaving for your, it's, you're a textile artist yeah. amongst m many other um, uh, disciplines that you have, mm. but I wanted to know how it affected your work and maybe take the opportunity to talk a little bit about that Ebe weaving heritage. Mm. Um, so I was born here 
Um, but I was, um, we moved to Ghana when I was, just before my seventh birthday, but, and I remember my mum taking me to this weaving village in Everland somewhere, I don't remember where it was, and it was a thing where I was kind of looking back now having, you know, being an artist and realising that that was the seed that I didn't realise kind of birthed all of this. Um, because I just, I just remember being taken by these massive looms and then they had these expansive yarns dyed like in these gorgeous colours just lying out in the sun. And I was like, I didn't really know what was going on, but I just, it was just magical and beautiful. And then fast forward to then, I decide I want to do textile design at uni. So I did textile design at college when I did my BTEC National Diploma. I did a general art and design course and textiles was one of the kind of modules. And then it was just like felting, paper making, you know, they didn't have like, you know, machines and stuff. And I just really gravitated. There was something about like making that I just really gravitated to. So I decided I wanted to do textile design. And it was just, I just found my home, you know. Um, and, you know, I worked in fashion design and all of these things kind of led me back to becoming an artist and I didn't realise that. Um, and it was when I started my practice and really started making with textiles, with the tights, that I realised that, but wait, this is what we do as ever, is I'm just living my truth. And I didn't realise it, you know, until that moment. So that was a really kind of beautiful full circle moment. So I always say it's something that's kind of been inherent in me and I didn't realise because I've never really had a, you know, I didn't grow up in Ghana. I didn't grow up, you know, knowing weaving. Um, it was actually someone at my Sunday school that taught me to knit, hand knit initially before I even did textile design. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I did have the opportunity when I went to Ghana, at one point there was a project that I wanted to do around weaving and I met with a master weaver. Um, and one of the beautiful things he told me is that he said that there's this fable that spiders taught the airways to weave. And you'll know my final year at university, I did a whole project around spider webs. So for me, that was just a really kind of beautiful connecting thread. Can you imagine closing the loop and going back? I know. You're going to that's, do that? That's, that's, that's on yeah, the horizon? That's, yeah, that's on the horizon, yeah. <laughs> There's questions from the back, from online. And I suppose to, to finish off, really, to close off and to piggyback a bit off the your final, uh, what you've just said, what is next for you? Um, so next week, uh, <laughs> I will be at 154 African Art Fair showing with uh, my gallery Taffeta. Um, and then the week after that, I head off to Omaha in Nebraska. So I have a res two month residency and I've actually been invited to make a new work for an exhibition that I've been invited to participate in that opens in December. So I'm really excited for that. Um, and it will just be another beautiful way to close off the year, so. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Anam and Lisa. It's been, um, it, it's been wonderful to kind of hear about your journey and to hear more about the works in detail as well. Um, so um, Delu exhibition will be on until the 13th of January. So do come along and see the exhibition. And um, Anam will be back with us on Tuesday, uh, this coming Tuesday, um, to do a, a gallery walkthrough um, where you'll be able to hear a bit more about the, um, the, uh, some of the uh, existing works in the exhibition and some of the newer works as well. So we do invite you to, enjoy, uh, to join us. We think we've got a few places left um, um, for people to book onto um, for that as well. And please do take a programme guide and an exhibition and, and guide as well um, to find out more of what's going on at NAE over the next couple of months. But um, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone for coming out today and a big thank you to everyone for um, who's watched the, the live stream as well. And just to let you know, this conversation has been recorded and it will be um, placed in our resource area for you to watch back um, for the course of the season. And it will also be available for you to watch on New Art Exchange's YouTube as well. And just a final thing on your way out, um, if you're able to just quickly fill out a quick survey about your visit today, that would be really helpful for us in, in, in terms of getting feedback and also for our funders as well, and would really appreciate that. Um, but I just want to say a big thank you to Enam and Lisa for um, this afternoon's insightful conversation. And thank you to, to you all for attending. Please take more cake if you'd like. <laughs>
like to. Um, for those who came in a little bit later, um, this week we've been celebrating 15 years of Nuart Exchange, and so it's some of our birthday cakes, so do feel free to take some on your way out. But thank you very much, and have a lovely weekend. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, and also a big thank you to Phil and Andy from Lindley Productions, who've done all the tech today. Um, thank you. And to Kyle as well for assisting as well. And thank to you. you very much, and Kyle. To you. Oh, thank you.